more Australian cars. Time to look at some Australian cars. Let's do it. Some traditional Australian machines. Alrighty. So here's the Valiant Ute in its final form. So this one's a CL, so probably about 76, 77. Okay, this is the last Valiant Ute. Yeah, so they're built on the same platform as your 60s Valiant you had in the States, but a little bit wider. Mm. But everything essentially is the same. The suspension's the same. You know, a few other changes. This yes. one's got... 245 or 4 liter Hemi 6. That is an Australian engineered engine called the Hemi 6. Uh, yeah, no, it, it, this one's still three on the tree. Look at this bench seat, three on the tree, Hemi 6. By the way, this vehicle in the US has a back seat, so this area is still there. You got storage back to here. Storage underneath the back seat, it goes down below the bed or tray as they call it here. Yeah, it's freaking epic. And the center part of the bumpers are usually missing on these. Yeah, these always had bumperettes, so the tailgate can drop all the way down, so you can back all the way up to a loading ramp. It's great. So here's a Statesman DeVille. Um, so this would be oh, 1980 or so. so a hold, this are, is a Holden. Yep, these are our like, luxury cars, you could say. So it's based on a Kingswood. Um, you know, the sedan from that era, but you know, slightly extended wheelbase. You know, slightly more over here in interior. Okay, okay. So there's pl there are plenty of uh, plenty of British cars around here. Huh? Oh yeah, the British cars had a real presence here, particularly in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, as our car industry was starting up. So there's lots of people who absolutely love those. Um, there's an Australian spec Falcon. So what what are these skirts down here? Is that um, just mud flaps? Huh? Yeah. Uh, I love I love this. The air clean is coming out of this thing. <laughs> We need to get the bachelor party in a hurry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, this is not particularly Australian, but it's but it is incredible. We'd be idiots not to show it. It's a widened beetle with a V8. Yeah. <laughs> this is incredible. Here, stand there just to get an idea of the. What an absurd machine. I love it. Here's an EH Holden. So 64. These one of the most popular Holdens. Um, nowadays, with people you know, restoring them and rotting them, this one's got triple webbers, so she's probably a little bit more poked than the standard red six. Yeah, holding. So these are pretty. There are a couple of these here, right? Yeah, yeah. They're they're, they're really loved by a lot of people. Um, they were the first car for a lot of you know, the boomer generation, things like that. So the, so it, they it, absolutely love them. Is this kind of the your, the Chevy Bel Air of Australia in some ways? Not quite. Uh, not quite, but similar similar lines, I guess you could say. Um, and then this is the later Kingswood. So these are, you know, so that's 64, this one would be probably about 74, 75. Yeah, so it's got the, the 253 V8, which is the Holden's produced V8. Mm -hmm. Big damn thong slapper, by the sound it makes when it's under acceleration. Thong is a, a flip-flop or a sandal, for the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> then here's the same area here. This is the Belmont, this is the base model, so there's like no chrome trim, barely any trim at all. Nice big old tray. Bumperettes again. Mm -hmm. No storage under. That was, is that a Valiant thing? Yeah, yeah, that was a Valiant thing. So there is that space in these, but there's no real access to it in the um, Holden Utes really at all. Think about that. This is ba this is based on a four door vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. So they turned it into a truck, and they basically have this. They have the space underneath the bed that's just there that you can't get to. That's it. Yeah, a lot of people cut them up and that's where they'll store bat their batteries or maybe a fuel tank, things like that. They'll just put a door right here and just... Yeah, they'll just yeah, modify it. But yeah, as they came, it was basically just an empty space. So, this is the last of the line for the, the big body Holden Utes. Is after it... this, there was no Holden Ute for 10 years or so. So after that, they became Commodore based, but there was quite a gap in between. So this is the last of the real Holdens, they say? That, that's right. A lot of people think this is the last real Holden. And yeah, these have a real cult following as well. My brother had one of these back in high school. Yeah, great vehicles. 
So when did um when did when did GM get into the picture? Uh, GM bought Holden back in the 30s. Mm. Um, Holden before that was a coach builder. So what would happen is you get the chassis of say a British car or an American car come in, they'd build the body. Um, TJ Richards was the one of their competitors that also then turned into Chrysler Australia later down the line. Yeah. Um, Ford was the only one pre-World uh, pre, uh, War II that had their own facilities. Oh. Um, and that's where they invented the ute back in the 1930s. Ford did? Yes. Oh. Yes. Lou Bant was the designer of the Ford ute back in 1932, if memory serves correctly. And from yeah, World War II onwards, um, Australia decided it wanted a car industry, and so Chrysler and um, GM decided to come into the market and start building vehicles here. And they basically commissioned those two coach builders to do it for them. That's right, yeah, from their facilities they expanded out and made proper factories and started pumping vehicles out. So there'll be a couple early holds here we can take a look at at the very first and they're based on some old Buick designs. So why is the Ute so popular here? Um, just the usefulness of it because you've got the comfort of a sedan, the carrying capacity of a truck. Um, the, it all came from a, apparently a letter from a farmer's wife saying she wanted a vehicle they could take pigs to market on Monday and drive to church on Sunday. And that's where the whole idea came from. So, you know, a ute is based on a sedan, um, is the general definition, um, not a truck, so it doesn't ride like a truck. So, you know, comfortable, carries some load, just extremely useful. So, that's where that love really comes from. Hmm. A lot of American cars, Mustangs, mm -hmm. um, Camaros the, are pretty popular. Camaros. Some cars here were imported, some were sold here. Yep. Um, what is the relationship uh, with American car culture here in Australia? Um, well, yeah, our car culture is very similar. You know, we love our V8s, we love our muscle cars. Um, yeah, so there were some vehicles uh, like AMC Javelins were built here as a kit, so mm -hmm. a complete knockdown kit. Oh, okay. They were assembled in a factory in Altona, which then became the Toyota plant mm -hmm. uh, later on. Uh, but they were very expensive. They were more than twice the price of a Monaro or a V8 Falcon. Um, a lot of people later on started importing American cars from about the 80s onwards. Look at this so thing. Anything that's 25 years or older can stay left-hand drive. Um, you don't need to put amber indicators on them anymore, but for a period you did, so you will see a few with like these really tacky added on ones like trailer lights. Oh yeah. That... Um, so yeah. I yeah, mean, I, I'm... So you can sort of tell where a when a vehicle was imported as to whether it had those or not. I'm pro amber indicator for the record. Oh well, look at this, a Corvette. So, yeah, you know, here's a vet. So this one's been converted to right hand drive. Oh wow, a right hand drive conversion. Yeah, so a lot of people do that. It's a very expensive process. Wow, yeah, I bet. So you'll is. see some newer muscle cars also come in. Like there are the odd like 2015 challenges and chargers and Camaros and things like that. And they've been right-hand drive converted, so the price is about triple what you would pay in the States. Because you've got to pay the price in the States, get it on a boat, get it here, get it converted, mm. get it engineered and complied. And so let's say a forty thousand dollar car becomes hundred and fifty thousand dollars very quickly. Yeah. Huh. Got another Falcon here. We saw one of these earlier. Yep. <laughs> so this looks like a Fox Body Mustang to me. Yeah, so this is a oh. Falcon S. Falcon S. That looks like a four-door Fox Body Mustang in some ways. Yeah, this is yeah, early early 80s. Valiant. The rear end's totally different, right? We never got yep. the orange. Look at that orange. They're beautiful. Valiant by Chrysler. It even says that on the front. See, we never got a Chrysler Valiant in the US, so that's an example of like the alternate universe sort of joke I made earlier. It's this, I own basically this car in the US, and it was a Plymouth Valiant. Yeah, you see, there's a Chrysler Valiant. Look at that. The branding was different, there were some styling differences. But otherwise, yeah, this is I. This is just exactly like my car. Yeah, the dash is a mirror image, essentially, yeah. of the American. They didn't change these a lot. Um, as I got into the 70s, our cars got more and more Australianized, but from this period, they were largely the American ones. Some local differences, but not a lot. So some of the parts from yours will come into these quite easily, like interior parts, dash parts. Yeah. Yeah, they're not, not as Australianized yet. 
This is a great show here. Look at all these people. This one's just a standard barrel, full meters, full turbo. So what's the deal with the bearing, Andrew? What do we need to know about it? Um, yeah, very strong, cross-bolted uh, mains, so that gives them a lot of strength. Uh, there is a difference between the turbo and the non-turbo, it's kind of like the 2J and the 1J. You know, you can make the non-turbo versions work. Mm -hmm. They will ultimately have a lower horsepower ceiling before you need to make mods. Yep. But yeah, valve spring change, um, a few other changes and they're ready for a turbo. But this one's got a lot of work done to it. Yeah. For a long time, barrows weren't expensive. You can get them from the wreckers for like five, six hundred bucks. Wow. You know, guaranteed running. But now the price is probably triple or quadruple because, yeah, everyone loves a barrow. And I know some of them are starting to go into the United States as well. So we have got a lot of them, but that supply is, of course, finite. And we never made as many engines as anywhere anyone in America did. Um, I wouldn't even think there's a million barrows. There wouldn't be anywhere near that, so. What do we need to know about this GTXU1 here? GTRXU1. Yeah. So this is a Tirana. So this is our compact line of cars. So Holden had the Tirana, Ford had the Cortina, Chrysler in the 70s had the Centura, which is actually based on a Simca with an extended nose to fit a Hemi 6. Mm -hmm. So these are all six cylinders. Um, the GTRXU1 won at Bathurst back in 71 from memory. Look at that. So it's a three litre Holden red inline six with triple Stromberg carbies. So it's just lightweight, makes the power to weight is good and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty good handling as well, though it's a really good all round package, but these things are worth an absolute pile of money. Are now. they? Yeah, they're worth a lot of money. It's funny because it's, it's, not, it's not clear to me which ones are worth a ton. Like this one, yeah. apparently it's worth a ton, and, and the um, sort of that. Um, What's the other one you Oh, mentioned? the GT Falcon. GT Falcon, yeah. Yeah, the XY. Yeah, they're worth. Sorry. You're right. A lot of it's pedigree, right? Yeah. Um, did they win at Bathurst is a large part of it. Um, and that's why Valiants are worth a little bit less, because they never did quite get the podium. Um, they got the top three quite a few times, but they never they never took the title, which made the difference. Think about that. The value of a car is based on whether or not it won at a race. Like that is it's such a it's such a wild thing to me. Yeah, and often who drove it as well. So this launched Peter Box career. Oh, okay. You know, the most successful driver at the back of 1000 series of races. So that's a lot of the appeal to these as well, is the fact that, you know, Brocky won with these. Same as VL Commodores, same with a few other different Commodore models. Um, the performance versions of those are worth a lot of money because Peter Brock did his magic in that chassis. <laughs> that's awesome. All right, Lawrence, uh, apparently behind you is a legendary car that's worth a ton of money. Yep, so yeah, this is the GT Falcon um, XY, so that 1970s, 1971. So these also won at Bathurst um, in the hands of Alan Moffat, who was actually a Canadian racing driver. Um, he's actually responsible for really lifting the professionalism of Australian racing. So before that, a lot of drivers would actually just drive their car to the track. You see a lot of period photos, especially from the 60s, where the cars are racing around Bathurst at you know, 120 miles an hour with number plates on. Mm. You know, they drive them there and they drive them back again. Often they break the engine in on the drive from Sydney or Melbourne <laughs> to Bathurst. I mean, that's pretty epic though. Yeah, it is. It's, it's amazing what they used to do back then. Um, yeah, so these, these won Bathurst and so that really raised their price. These actually, um, the genuine GTHO Phase 3. Uh, they only made, I think, about 300 of those. They're the most expensive Australian muscle car. They sold for over a million dollars Australian before. Wow. Um, I don't know if this one's a genuine or not. I'm not too up on, you know, the little the little things you need to look for. Um, uh, yeah, this is one of the legendary Australian cars. So 351 Cleveland under the bonnet, four speed, nine inch. Uh, just real plastic looks. You've got the super room. Oh yeah, yeah, look at that. a roo with a mid-mounted V8. <laughs> a mid-mounted V8 kangaroo, folks. Yeah, yeah, so you got That's incredible. Shaker. <laughs> I mean, I would... That alone gives it a lot of value to me, that V8 roo. Yeah, it's interesting. So it's very common to see replicas of these. Um, there's an old joke saying for it, there was only... Sorry, there's 350 GTHOs, and now 40 years later, there's only 5,000 of them left. <laughs> yeah. So it's very hard to tell unless you're in the know whether it's a genuine GT or a GTHO. I mean, I understand why people replicate them. They're a legendary car and they look sensational for that period. But yeah, I don't know enough about identifying a, a true GT. 
I love the fact that a four-door car has a lot of value because you know old school old timers in the US they say it's all about the two-door you know we didn't have a lot of coupes over here. Oh, okay. um, often the coupes were more expensive than the sedans by quite a margin. Um, it was only things like the Charger and the Tirana that were actually affordable to the common man. But yeah, most I'm, people in Australia were practical. They had families. They actually just wanted a car where they could drive it to work. They could take the kids to school in it, and they could still have some fun with the V8 and the four-speed. Yeah. You know, we we love our coupes as well, but we weren't too bothered about having four doors. Either. That's cool. I, I like that. There's sort of an exclusive exclusivity to the whole, you know, car culture in the U.S. Sometimes people will really talk down on four doors. So I, I like this. This is cool. Okay, what is this here? Yep, so this is an FJ Holden. So, absolutely universally beloved Australian car. So, early 50s. Um, Holden Grey inline six. So, probably all about 90 odd horsepower. But very commonly hot rodded as well. Definitely gives us some sort of. Buicky vibes, definitely. So the story, as far as I'm aware, is it was um, a shell Buick design from around uh, the war, war period. So we started making Holdens in 1948. This is the second model. Largely the same vehicle, just some slight differences in the front grille and things like that. Mm. So these are often named Humpies. Humpies, all right. Yeah, so uh, very common back in the day, if you're a young lad in the 60s or 70s, you swap a Holden Red 6 in there, you might put, say, you know, multiple carburetors really loud exhaust, fox tail hang off the aerial, um, you know, mag wheels, all that sort of stuff, and really? just tear up the neighborhood. This thing? You, yeah, yeah, this was... This does not look like it would have been... This was like... Kind of a hillbilly hot rod car. American Graffiti Australian style. Australian Graffiti, let's say. Oh, okay. This was, this was one of the cars if you were a young lad in the 60s. Dude, it, it looks a little old to be a... You know, to have been a kind of a hot rodder's car in the 60s or a... Yeah, no, they absolutely love them. I love that center tail light there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is a later Tirana, uh, about 76, 77 or so. These also won at Bathurst in what's called the A9X. That was the chassis like option code. Um, these are also worth a lot of money if they're a genuine A9X, but the plain hatch as well is also worth good money. They had an option called the hatch hutch. So you'd open the hatch and there'd be a tent you could attach to it. Wow. Um, Sort of extend the extend the sleeping area to a degree. Not quite a panel van, but you know, convenient for camping, I suppose. So yeah, these are also nice and compact. But yeah, yeah. this thing is small. What was um? You could get different motors in this, huh? Yeah, no, yes. Right. So briefly, you could get a uh, four-cylinder, a six-cylinder, and an eight-cylinder in these. I mean, it is pretty badass. Yeah. So those flares were part of the standard A9X package. Oh, those are. Factory flares? Those are based on the factory flares. I don't know oh. if this one's genuine or not, but that is huh. what they look like. <laughs> That's just epic. Lawrence has told me that we have to stop by this car and discuss it. So oh, uh, mandatory. 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 This is a '73 XB Falcon Coupe. A lot of you Americans will be familiar with this as the car that Max Rockatansky, aka Mad Max, drives in the series of movies. So this is the uh, Interceptor. So this is one you know, not set up for the apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Mad Max car. Incredible. Yeah. So this is a local car. The guy's had it for oh, 20 something odd years. It's been rebuilt three or four times. Various different iterations, but still on the road, which is fantastic. What do we got under the hood? 351, I believe. And then a C4 automatic, I think, in the 9 inch. Memory serves correct. Sounds I love that wraparound dash. Wow, yeah. Incredible. All right, so this and that yep. are similar. Yeah, so that's an XA, so it's probably 71, 72, and then that's 73, so 
basically the same thing, you know, slight differences in marker lights and things like that. So yeah, XA GT sedan. So as we said before, Aussies have no issue with a high performance four door. Um, yeah, Dude. a lot of people love these, use these as family cars, they tow their boat on the weekend with them. Dude, these, you've got some sick four door cars here. I mean, that's great. And then we have another four door here. This is an XE, I believe, so about 83, 84. Dude, four doors are in here, man. Yeah, yeah. Look, well, what do we got there? What's that um, newer car? Looks like a uh, white and uh... That's the VS, Commodore SS, so about 97 or so. You're calling Bomber Doors. <laughs> you call them what? Bomber Doors. <laughs> Bomber Doors. Oh. Yeah. Oh, or Dunny Doors. <laughs> Dude, four doors, man. Four doors are, four doors are cool. All right, so we all know what a Pacer is, right? In the US, it's an AMC. Some people think it's uncool, but here in Australia, a Pacer is irrefutably cool. And it's obviously not the same view. Behold. So this is a VG, so 1970, uh, the year after David's Utes, or the model after David's Utes. So basically, US A body dart platform, but as you can see, it's quite a bit different. Look at this. Drive. So, this is a Dodge Dart, except not. You've got the Valiant fenders just like mine with the indicators up top. And where were these built? Oh, uh, si well, okay. Well, probably not an original six pack, right? But probably not. No, these were originally just a 245 with like a two barrel or maybe a four barrel if you were lucky. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, 200 ish horsepower generally. Um, yeah, these the, the bodies were basically brought in as kits, um, generally through Chrysler in the US, and then assembled over here. So they're almost a dart, but not quite. There's quite a few differences under the skin if you know where to look. Awesome.